blessed to be here. Uh, it's always uh, it's always fun to get together with other believers and, and, and non-believers and just uh, talk about the Word of God. And uh, if there's one thing that I'm guilty of, and I was thinking about it this morning as I was praying, is that um, whenever I'm asked to do something, um, I tend to overdo things. And that could be a good and bad, I guess, to a fault. But um, what I mean by that is if I'm asked to do a 30-minute presentation, I prepare an hour or two hours of material. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if anybody else is that guilty, but I am. And then I have to condense it, and then you have to rush, and you have to shove through. So what I'm going to ask for is some grace or mercy up front. Uh, obviously, if I'm a little scattered sometimes because my brain is wanting to go in 20 different directions, and I'm, I have to con con uh, reel it all in. So with that being said, um, I like how we start out with uh, with questions, and I like to kind of uh, think things out. And so the most important thing that I would think about when I start to talk, and I would I would ask a question, what is more important, praying or reading the Bible? Hmm. 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 Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. And uh, Carrie, I'll pick on you. What, what, what would you say the answer would be? Oh, let's see. Um, hmm. I would say reading the Bible because that's the way God talks to us. We can, you know, you can pray as much as you want and say, God, I need this. God, I need that. You know, you're awesome, whatever. But if we don't read the word, we're not going to hear what God wants to tell his people. Thank you, Carrie. And uh, it's interesting. It's a trick question. Whenever I ask it, I get about a 50-50 divide and they each have a reason why. Okay. So then I follow up with another question and I say, what is more important, breathing in or breathing out? Okay. And then people kind of get the aha, right? So breathing in is obviously as important as breathing out. The next question I would then follow up and ask and say, what is more important, doing the work of God or working for God? And there's another, wow, an aha question. But what I tend to think in my head, or at least in my heart, is that when I look at these questions, there's always something that I think is initial and then the follow-up. So with me praying and reading the Bible, and again, this is just personal, um, I always want to commune with the Lord first. I want to get together with him first. I want to pray. I want to speak to him. I want to listen to him. Right? I want him to open me with the Holy Spirit. And then I want to then go read his word and see what he has to say to me. And again, he is talking to me in a prayer-like setting in that. So again, there's there's nothing right or wrong here. But breathing in, you know, you breathe in first, right? God put the breath in our lungs. We breathe in and then we breathe out, right? And the last thing, the reason I bring this up is, is doing the work of God is what I consider the initial part that we do for the Lord. It'll make sense as we get together here. And then, of course, um, working for God is what I call the sanctification process or the ongoing process after we've done the work of God. And that'll make more sense in a moment here. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to open up with uh, who's showing the uh, presentation. I want to make sure I see it. Thank you. Beautiful. So thank you, uh, Brother Simon. So doing the work of God, John 6, 28 through 40. All right. So what I'm going to do here for a quick moment, um, if we can back, we'll go back to the initial page, please. Uh, one more. All right. There. Yep. Stay right there. So let's read together uh, John 6, 28 or John 6, 26 through 40. It'll take just a moment, but it really sets the, the light of what we're going to do today. It says, Jesus answered them and said, truly, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you ate of the loaves, because you had your belly filled. And it says, labor not, or, or don't go after the meat which will perish. He says, but for the meat which will endure or last unto en enter, excuse me, everlasting life, which the Son of Man, which he's speaking of himself, shall give unto you. For had God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, so they, they answer, asked him a question, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? So now the question's being asked here. What is the work of God? And it sounds like something that we are doing, we must do. And let's, let's read on further. Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he, uh, whom he hath sent. Then they said unto him, what sign do you show that we may see and believe thee? What is this work? And they say, our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it was written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
And Jesus said, truly, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, he's speaking of himself, and giveth life unto the world. And then they said, Lord, give us this bread. We, we want it. What do you, you know, I, I get it, but what, what are you talking about? And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He now is cut into the chase. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he that cometh to me, cometh to me, shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And they said, and he said, all you have seen and still you believe not. All that the father giveth me shall come to me. And for him, uh, and him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. He says, you come to me and you're mine forever. You're, you're going to be with me forever for eternity. And he says, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the father's will, the one that sent me. And this is the father's will, that all of you, which he hath given me, should I lose none, but should raise up on the last day. And then he goes on, and this is what clarifies the whole point. And this is the will of God that set me, that everyone that seeth the Son, which is himself he's speaking of, believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. I know that was a lot. But initially, doing the work of God is believing on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So that's what I consider to be the most important thing that we can do in our lives and share with others in their lives. When you look on the initial slide there, it says, are we working for God or are we doing the work of God? That's what I was bringing up. You see that Jesus was a soul winner. All right. That's what he came to do. It says he came, if you look below that, for the son of man, Jesus is come to seek and save that which was lost. Seven. Thank you. So what is the work of God? Well, we read through John 6, 26, and we see that believing on Jesus Christ. Our labor work is in knowing him and telling others about him, because that's what Jesus was doing. He was saying what the work of God is, and he was saying that I'm here to do it. And he's our example and our model. Um, quickly, uh, when it comes to testimonies, people always share their testimony and they tell how did they come to the saving knowledge? Okay, how did they get saved? How did they, uh, forget all the Christendom terms, but how did they just believe in Jesus Christ? Because the Bible says believe in Jesus and, and you get to go to heaven, right? If you, if you have a true desire in your heart that Jesus Christ is your Lord, your Savior, and you want him to save you, that's what it says in the scripture. That's how we are saved. So we need to understand the works that we do during our Christian walk, after we've done that, it's called sanctification. And we want it to be based on the Holy Spirit leading us. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, just open this up a little better. Um, there we go. So most importantly, let me just do this here for a quick second. Sorry. Yeah. Is that when we look at these things and we ask ourselves, what are we hungering for? Are we hungering to fill the belly? Are we hungering for the bread of life, which Jesus said he is, that he will fill us forever? So in my testimony, <clears throat> I was longing for something. I had a hole in my heart. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I needed it. And so I said, Jesus, I need you to save me. And what had happened is he sent people in my life. He kept, I, I wasn't hearing this obviously verbally, but in my heart of heart, I kept hearing, find me. And I, I didn't know what that meant. So he sent somebody that I that I grew up with that, in the neighborhood, and he told me about Christ. A couple of years later, I ran into him again as I was still seeking for Christ, and he told me about Christ. And then I finally understood what he had, and then I wanted that, what Christ said, the manna, right? I knew what I wanted. And so I went to a Bible study, and we were reading the book of Romans, and that was the time that I got saved. So I cut my testimony down pretty quick. Um, but uh, let me, I'm going to turn this here. I think it does. I'm going to read this better. There we go. So what are we called to once we become a child of God, a believer of Jesus Christ? We are called in 1 Corinthians that it says that we are to water and we are to plant and then God gives the increase. So basically what it's saying there is that we're just to go out and share with others our faith. It's very simple. We do it in love. 
right? And we talk to others and we say, hey, you know, is there a hole in your life somewhere? Everybody has a hole. I, it seems like everybody I talk to, when, you, when they'll bare their soul and they'll really uh, take off the, the disguise or the mask and the facade and they tell you really what's going on in their life, everybody ha is empty. And they long for something more than the houses and the jobs and, and the things and the money and the fame and whatever it is that you seek after. Um, they still get to the point where they need something more. And Mark 1.15, it says the kingdom of God is at hand. And it says repent and believe the gospel. Those are big words sometimes. People say repent. What, what does that mean? Well, repent is in the Greek, which if you went back to that, you don't have to, but it basically just a change of mind and heart. It's an instantaneous understanding that I am no longer going to put my faith in the world and what it can give me, okay, or my job or my hobbies or whatever it is, even my family for that matter, right? As important as they are, they can't give you that everlasting fulfillment, that Christ can. So he says, change your heart and mind about the world. And he says, and believe the gospel. And the gospel is the death and burial uh, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's, it talks about that in first Corinthians. Uh, Sibin, you can go to the, uh, to the next slide. Thank you. Um, Jesus said in John nine, he says, I must work, excuse me, the works of him that sent me while it is day. And he said, the night cometh when no man can work. So what's happening here is, is there's a point that it comes where all of us, including what we do and what others are, are listening to, that the night comes. And that means there's the end where we no longer have the opportunity. Okay. Um, what this is saying here is that we can serve the Lord while we're working for our employer, whether we own a business and have employees, whether we work for somebody, uh, whether we're a stay-home mom or dad, um, whatever the case may be, we can still serve the Lord while doing these things. We can find ways to share the gospel with others. All right, and remember, if anyone's on this call and they're and they're seeking and they're not quite sure what all of this means, you know, feel free to reach out to me, uh, reach out to Sister Carrie, uh, Sadapti, Sibin, others, Brother Sibin that are on the call, um, because we can go through this with you and we can help you better understand this. It's, it's not rocket science. It truly is. And it's just an opening of the heart and a believing of the mind to understand some new truth. Okay. So the good news is, is we talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ is, and it's, it's in first Corinthians 15, one and four, all right? But there's something that's important in Ephesians 6 that I like to talk about, and it says, uh, it says servants, okay, or, or friends, be obedient to them that are um, your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of God. So uh, be respectful to those that you're with. Uh, and it does say that knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same he shall receive of the Lord. So what it's talking about here is, is that what we want to make sure is that we're not giving lip service. So we're not just saying that we believe something or do something, but we actually want to sincerely in our heart of hearts be able to do this so that we understand that we can be free. Okay. So do we serve the Lord with a healthy fear, with a heart for him? Okay. Have we called on him sincerely uh, to be our savior? All right. And there's some scriptural references that, that I list there. And, and, you know, the most important thing that I like in Colossians 3.22, it says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. So as for him. So if we are going to do something, you know, do it with all your heart, do it with all your might. Okay. Do it with all your will, but do it so that it's pleasing, that it glorifies God. All right. That's the most important thing. It, it is exciting for us. And it is fun for us that I, that I say we have delight and sharing uh, things that we are excited about with others. You know, people go about sharing movies they saw or they share their job or vacation they went on. And those are all wonderful. They really are. But more so important to share the love of Christ that's in you with others. And First Corinthians, it just kind of reemphasizes where, wherefore or wherever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. 
Okay, so that's most important that that I can think about when it talks about um, on the work and the labor of God. Remember, we're going to work doing the work of God, and then we're going to work for God. Okay, uh, Sibin, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Thank you. You know, I was reading a book on um, called Jesus and Company, and it was quite interesting. And it was all about Jesus in the marketplace. So a lot of us think about Jesus as God or the Savior or the Son of Man or a prophet. Oh, there's so many different things. A good guy, a good man, right? Uh, a historical figure, right? Um, but when he, when he came down from earth, and it says in John 1, 1, that God became man uh, and became flesh, right? And he was, he was the Word, and it was Jesus, and Jesus is, is the Lord. Um, it was interesting that when he set about his ministry at around age 30 for about three and a half years, he was doing one and one thing. Well, not, not one thing only, but most importantly, he was seeking and saving the lost, right? He was seeking the lost to, to save them. And in the marketplace, it says that he spent 90% of the time among the common folk. And that'd be all of us, right? And we all do the same thing. We get up and we go about our day. And we're all among ourselves, the common folk. And I don't care if it's Hollywood. I don't care if it's you know, political figures. I don't care if it's our job. I don't care if it's the grocery market. Okay. We're all in the marketplace. But what was interesting, he spent 90% of the time in the marketplace and he developed relationships with those people. And because his job, right, was to go out into soul wind, and that's a fancy word for telling others about himself at the time and really about the Lord, right? As they share a, a common respect to each other, that's something that we can do. So, you know, we're out in the marketplace the majority of the time. So how are we sharing our faith with others? Okay. Um, has anybody ever loved their wife or their children or their job so much that they haven't told anybody about them? Of course not. We all love to talk about our spouses and our children, right? Our family, what they do, their accomplishments. Do you ever love Jesus so much that you don't tell someone about him? Think about it, okay? Who are soul winners in the Bible? So when we, when we get to the bigger picture, the major theme, we talked about the love of Jesus Christ, right? Is that he was the greatest soul winner in the Bible. Normally, I ask a question, but this is not really a Q&A, and I'll say, who was the greatest soul winner in the Bible? And for those that read the Bible and study, et cetera, they, they instinctively say, Paul. And they would be right if I was talking just merely a man, a human, which Paul was the greatest soul winner in the Bible. But Jesus Christ is the greatest soul winner in the Bible, and he is our example and our model. And Paul even said, come follow me as I follow Christ. So we know that's where Paul got it from. So all glory uh, be to our Father in heaven, right? <clears throat> when you look at Christ, his desire was for every person that ever walked the earth would get saved, right? Come to know him as the Savior and spend eternity in heaven with him. So when I look at um, 2 Peter 1, 9, and bear with me for a moment, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um, that's a that's King James that I read out of, but that's just a fancy way of saying he, he's not willing that anybody, anybody should not come to the saving knowledge of knowing who he is and calling on him to be the savior, okay, of their lives, right? That's really what he wants. That's so important. And it says in Romans 8, 28, it says, we know all things work together for good to them that love God. So that's kind of a neat promise. We know that if we love God, everything's going to work together for good. We may not see it up front, but we will see it at the end. And it says to them that are called according to his purpose, because he knew them before the beginning of time and he predestinated, he understood they were going to call on him to be the savior. And it says to be conformed into the image of his son. Okay. And it's talking about Jesus Christ here. All right. So it's important that we know that's what we're called to do is be conformed to be like Christ. And Christ was a soul winner. We should be a soul winner. Um, many people in Romans um, 8.28 casually think that when, you know, things are going bad, 
there's something very important about that. It's going to it's going to be good, and I get it. But it's more important that the end result is we're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Um, look at my notes for something. You see the love of God, His precious grace, grace His plenteous and mercy. We have salvation in the Lord and Him only. John fourteen six says that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father in heaven is through Jesus Christ. So we know that he was the greatest soul winner. I'm looking at my notes. We can go on to the next slide, Simon. Thank you. So we said he was the greatest soul winner. He had compassion throughout those on the, in the Bible. He said when he saw the multitudes, and this was so important in, uh, in Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the multitude, he saw the masses, when he saw the marketplace, the common folk, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. They were tired. They were scattered abroad. They were afraid. And it says, as has sheep having no shepherd. You've seen sheep when they run around without a shepherd, without a guide dog to keep them. They're, they're just reckless. And he says, then he said unto his disciples, the harvest, which is those that don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, is plenteous. That there's a lot of them that need to know who I am. Jesus is saying they need to know who I am. But the laborers, those that are telling the masses about me are few. So he's pray, he says, pray there to the Lord of the harvest, right? To the Father in heaven, to God, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. There's an interesting story about the Samaritan woman. And if anybody remembers that, um, it was in John 4, where she had come to the well to get a drink of water. And she was thirsty. And of course, and she was getting water and Jesus was there and she ran into him. And to keep the story quick, um, she was talking to him and Jesus was talking to her. And then she perceived by what he was saying, because he had told things about her that no one would know necessarily, especially a stranger. And she said, I, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then she said we, that she knew the Messiah was coming. And he said, if you understood who you were talking to, that's me. She ended up getting saved right there because he said, I have living water. You'll never thirst again. And what was interesting, the very first thing she did, if you go on to read, is she became a soul winner. The first thing she did is she ran back to her town and she told everybody there about the Messiah, that she found the Christ. And all of a sudden, they all came running to see who Jesus was. What's interesting about that story is, I guarantee you that after they saw who he was, I, I shouldn't say I guarantee all of them, but the majority of them that believed on him, they went and told others as well. And that's what this is about. So Jesus made it clear that we're not going to always have him. In uh, Matthew 26, 11, he said, for you're always going to have the poor. We're always going to have all of us, everybody, right? But we're not always going to have him. So are we feeding the belly or are we feeding the soul? And remember the cart before the horse story at the very beginning where I was saying, do we pray or read first? Do we do the work of God first? Do we breathe, breathe in, breathe out first? What are we feeding first? Are we feeding the belly? And if we are, I understand, good thing. You know, we want to help our neighbors. We want to help um, the poor. We want to help ministries. Uh, missionaries go all over doing those things. They, they help people that are sick. But the problem is, is they're still going to be hungry the next day, right? They still may be sick a week later. They still might get sick next year. They're still going to be thirsty tomorrow. So it's more important that we feed the soul, right, and feed the belly, right? Feed the soul first so we know that if anything were to happen, if you're hungry tomorrow, the soul is filled, though. That's the important thing, right? So feed the spirit, and then we can take care of the flesh, right, afterwards. Thank you, Sid. We're getting through this. Other soul winners in the Bible, Paul, Peter, John the Baptist, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Noah, so much more. There's something in uh, scripture called the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And this is where we're all called to do this. Okay? We are all called to go out and share. It says, go therefore and teach all nations. That means teach everybody, right? Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost and teach them to do all things that I am with you always until the end of the world. So that's saying, go out and tell everybody about Jesus. Tell everybody about me. We're all called to do it. We are all called to do it. Um, in uh, Mark 6, 15, uh, let me find that scripture reference I have here. It says, go into all the world, 
preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, so it means to every person that's ever walked the earth, right? Uh, the beautiful gates in Act 3 6 is really neat because there's a lame man who's asking for money. And Peter says at that time he could have given him money if he had it, but he says, I have no silver and gold. He says, but what I do have is Jesus Christ. And he tells him to get up and walk, and he shares uh, the love of Jesus with him. Now, Sometimes people are sitting there asking themselves, well, I can't do this, or I, I'm not called to do this. That's for you to do, Brother Randall, or that's for uh, Sister Sadapti to do, et cetera, or for the preacher on TV, et cetera. But it says that in the scriptures that we all have the ministry of reconciliation. That means we all have the availability, excuse me, the availability to tell others about Jesus so they can be reconciled or they can be made right with God, right, uh, before um, they were to leave this world. And it says, of all things of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and this is where it's important, and has given us to the ministry of reconciliation, right? So that we all have the ability. Next one, Simon. So we talked about different examples of soul winners in the Bible. Um, we won't go through all of these. There's a lot. But the important thing is, is that these are all examples where John the Baptist uh, was, he had followers, right? And it talks about who his followers were, and then they came to see Christ. Andrew, as soon as he believed on Jesus as a savior, <laughs> he goes and tells Simon Peter, his brother, right? Jesus wins Philip, right? And he said, follow me. And then Philip, you know, tells Nathaniel, Jesus wins Zacchaeus, right? Philip wins the Ethiopian eunuch. That's an interesting one. Because Philip's the first missionary in the Bible. He's in one place, and Jesus says, I've got a job for you somewhere else. And he sends him over to, um, excuse me one moment. And he says to take him over to uh, another part of the world, and he helps a gentleman who's reading the Bible, and he doesn't understand who he's reading, the book of Isaiah. And Philip explains to him, and the eunuch, who was a, a very high prominent figure ends up getting saved and then he goes and gets baptized which was beautiful paul and silas when the jailers what's interesting is all these people are doing different things in their life right look at paul and silas they're in the jail all right they're in prison and they're sharing the love of jesus with others right uh peter preaches to, to win three thousand souls all right in the book of acts so you can see that all of us have the availability and in scripture it says today is the day of salvation right as we work together right, um, to uh, share the love of Jesus Christ, all right. Uh, so what I'd like to do is, you can leave that up if you'd like, Simon. Um, we're, we're gonna close here in just a moment. So make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you, okay? So what he's saying here is, is that we have that desire in us, right? Not only to seek the Lord, but to share the Lord, all right? I don't think there's a person I know that after they found that hole and they had a field with the love of Jesus Christ, I don't think I've ever found anybody who then got saved and had that hole filled that didn't want to go share with others. And my testimony piece that I mentioned earlier was that after I got saved, uh, Jesus had told me, now I want you to go share this with others, and I've been doing that for the last 23 years. God has put us in this place to use our time wisely. We spend about a third of our time in our lives working, right? Sometimes more. Some people work 12-hour days. So God takes ordinary people and ordinary places with ordinary jobs, but he gets extraordinary results for himself. We need to share with our bosses. We need to share with our friends. We need to share with our family. We need to share with strangers on the street. If anybody's interested in a really good book, uh, I'm going to, I don't know if that, oh, let's see here. Is it, can, uh, is it blurry? Seems like it's blurry. There, well, that might be. Uh, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's called Anyone But Me. Okay. And the author is Ray Comfort. And it's called 10 Ways to Overcome Your Fear and be prepared to share the gospel. It's a really simple book and it's really good. So anyone 
but me by Ray Comfort. Uh, another um, DVD that I have here is called Do Your Job, and it's by Mark Cahill, C-A-H-I-L-L. I actually have a bunch of these. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, either through uh, uh, Sister Sadapti, I can send these out to you. And there's a book that goes along with this. I may have a few extra books as well, but they really do a great job of helping us share the love of God. See your job as an opportunity. Be grateful, okay? And um, it, don't worry about if you don't know the words because it says in the scripture that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour what to say. So whenever I talk, I always ask to let the Holy Spirit speak through me. It says in Matthew 10, the spirit of your father speaks in you. So it's able to help you. So cast your burdens upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He'll never suffer the righteous to be moved. So you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Like it says in Philippians 2.15, there's many ways to share the scripture. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, there's gospel tracts. It's just going out and telling people, hey, you know what? I go to Bible studies. I go to church. You know, do you go to church? What church do you go to? Do you ever read the Bible? What are your thoughts on the afterlife? Where do you think we're going to go when we die? It's just some simple questions, but it, it's neat because it gets people to start talking uh, about questions uh, and, uh, excuse me, about answers and about things. And then you're able to share the love of God. The last thing I want to do as I'm done is remember that everyone in the scriptures, if you think about it, were soul winners. We were all about the same thing. Re remember that the Son of Man is to come and seek and save that which was lost. So let's go out and let's do the same thing. Remember the work of God and then working for God. Thank you. Mm -hmm.